Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the IISS webinar launching the June July issue of Survival Global Politics and Strategy, senior fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Um, and this issue of the journal was the first one entirely produced during the COVID lockdown, and we were very, very fortunate for us um, on the strategic implications of these events under the time tagline in the time of coronavirus. Uh, we actually have list on our cover uh, seven authors on this subject, including Mark Fitzpatrick, Stephen Simon, Veronica Angel, and Jonathan Stevenson, plus three who joined me today. Uh, Francois Heisberg, who is IISS Senior Fellow for, Senior Advisor for Europe and a Special Advisor at the FRS in Paris. Professor Heisberg has a long and distinguished government and scholarly career and was until very recently Chairman of the IISS Council and before that, uh, quite a while before that, he was Director of the IISS. And he joins us from Paris to discuss his article titled From Wuhan to the World, how the pandemic will reshape global politics. Uh, we're also joined by Gigi Quick Gronfall, a senior scholar um, at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor at the Hopkins Bloomberg, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her article in this issue is called The Scientific Response to COVID-19 and Lessons for Security. And she joins us uh, from Baltimore. And last but hardly least, uh, Sir Lawrence Friedman is Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College London and has written a, a true, truly blockbuster article. I never actually knew what blockbuster meant, but I'm sure this is a blockbuster uh, titled Strategy for a P Pandemic, the UK and COVID-19. Um, before we start, uh, just some practical instructions. I'm sure most of the, you in the audience have done more of these than I have and are very familiar with Zoom protocol. But there are two ways uh, to participate, asking questions, uh, either in writing in the um, Q&A function or by raising your hand under the raise hand icon at the bottom. And when we get to the uh, discussion period, I'll go back and forth, I'll read some of your questions, and I'll also uh, call on anybody who wants to, um, or as many of you as I, as I can, who want to pose your own question. So I'll start with uh, Professor Heisberg. Uh, Francois, you begin your piece on a note of intellectual humility and caution. Uh, you know, uh, you, you point out that from the very beginning of this crisis, there were uh, sort of a deluge of instant analyses of China up, America down, uh, the public health performances of authoritarian versus democratic um, states. And your note of caution is roughly what Zhao Enlai may or may not have said uh, to Andre Malraux or Henry Kissinger, which is it's too early to tell. Um, crucially, however, uh, what you do note is that although we can't really know geopolitical outcomes at this point. We can understand how those outcomes may be brought about because we, their processes are at work in front of our eyes. Uh, so what do you see? Uh, we are a little bit in the situation of uh, somebody who would have been asked in uh, November or December 1929 uh, what the strategic implications of the impending uh, Great Depression would be uh, 10 years down the road, like in 1939. Uh, anybody who would have uh, risked such an exercise uh, uh, would probably want to see uh, the results of that uh, analysis be buried very, very deep in the garden. Uh, uh, just a couple of points here. Uh, first of all, we, the instant analysis phase, uh, if I can call it that, actually went through uh, two permutations. That is, in the first six weeks of uh, the epidemic of what was initially called the, the Wuhan pneumonia, uh, was uh, China down, everybody else up 
uh, uh, there were in February, notably of this year, uh, there were there was a whole flurry of articles in the European press, in the American press, along the lines, "Oh, this is terrible! What's going to happen to uh, Xi Jinping? What's going to happen to the CCP?" Uh, uh, and in March, April, it was completely the other way around. Uh, the same uh, the same media outlets carried very distinguished pieces from equally distinguished people with equally definitive analysis on, oh God, this is terrible for the West. The Chinese are trampling all over us. So anybody who would have been in the mood of looking at the geopolitical or geostrategic consequences of COVID uh, like a horse race, uh, 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 after that tale wasn't going to be very eager uh, to, uh, to place a bet. A uh, couple of uh, points. Uh, first of all, uh, COVID is, a, is an epidemic. It's not uh, like your run-of-the-mill natural disaster, like an earthquake, a flood, a tsunami, uh, where it happens and you have to deal with the consequences. Uh, the pandemic, the virus, is a living being. It adapts uh, according to the laws of evolution. Uh, it has its own agenda, its own agenda for survival, its own agenda for uh, adaptation. Uh, and we are running after it. It is ahead of us. We will eventually catch up, but we haven't caught up yet. That's one of the reasons why we are in this very difficult situation. Uh, what we don't know about immunity, about seasonality, uh, means that we actually don't have any idea as to whether and when we may have a specific treatment, when or when we will have an effective, universal, seriously effective vaccine. And this overdetermines our own strategic response because we are reacting, we cannot be proactive at this stage, given our lack of knowledge. Uh, uh, if we knew that there was going to be a vaccine generally available at the end of next year, uh, strategies for dealing with the here and now of the pandemic uh, uh, could be quite different because we would know that the cavalry is going to come in sometime in November or December 2021. We don't know whether there is a cavalry and we don't know uh, when and how it is going to uh, eventuate. Uh, so where does this leave us? Well, we have, as it were, three phases. The first phase, which we are currently uh, undergoing, is uh, what I would call the, the easy phase uh, for, the for the political leaders. Political leaders uh, are the natural point towards which people turn, you know, uh, you've only got one nurse and you're not gonna let go of nurse for fear of worse. So whether the nurse is Putin, Xi Jinping, uh, possibly even Hafez al-Assad or Donald Trump or Angela Merkel, uh, it is very, very difficult for a politician not to do well politically from the current stage of the crisis. Look at Boris Johnson. Uh, and indeed look at Donald Trump, uh, you can actually commit uh, the functional equivalent of murder and get away with it during this phase. Uh, so here you have mostly winners. You have very, very few losers. Uh, paradoxically, uh, the, the most challenged leadership is probably the one I have in my own country, which is France. Uh, but in most other places, you know, take Italy, a terribly affected country. The opinion ratings for Prime Minister Conte are going through the roof, as they are for Angela Merkel. And uh, Donald Trump definitely has not lost his base. He's running at 44, 45% in the opinion polls, as he did at the elections in 2016. Uh, so that's phase one. And it's presumably going to last uh, until the current phase of the pandemic, the dangerous time for the politicians begins with the reopening, the lifting of the lockdowns, the, de, uh, the deconfinement. 
that's when uh, people will start recovering agency and start judging uh, their, uh, their leaders. Uh, and winners and losers may emerge. Uh, that will eventually lead to a third phase. And I'll come back to the winners and losers in the second conclusion. And then we'll have the third phase, which is the longer, deeper, less predictable phase, which is that geopo the geostrategy will be reshaped as a function of changes in society. Some of those changes I signal in my, uh, in, in my piece, but they take time uh, to, uh, to play out. The Franklin Roosevelt's, uh, the Hitler's, the Mussolini's, uh, uh, the Stalin terror part of uh, this tale uh, will unfold as the years go down. We will know in a few years uh, what kind of changes will have, what those changes will, how they will have changed uh, the geopolitics. Just a word on, on uh, populism and then I get to winners and losers. Traditional populism is actually in, in quite deep trouble. And I say that for reasons rather different than those of some other analysts who share the view that it's in trouble, like I think of my uh, friend uh, Bruno Tertre. Uh, but why is it in trouble? It's in trouble because much of the stock in trade of the populists uh, is now has been mainstreamed by COVID. Uh, borders, in the case of the European Union, are in. They're not out. Closing the other out is in, if I can put it that way. Uh, you don't have a migration debate anymore because you're not going to have any more migrants, if I can put it that way. That's a caricature, it's an oversimplification. But l'Europe qui protège, the Europe that protects, one of Macron's basic themes, has essentially been stolen away from the populists, the, the traditional populists. Some of them have tried to adapt by completely changing their colors, like the IFD in Germany. The IFD in Germany now complains about restrictions to movement, quarantines, terrible quarantines. Where is my freedom going? You know, these guys who are demonstrating to uh, prevent movement of people, to lift up the borders, are now the ones uh, who say, uh, let my people go, uh, make us free. Uh, maybe it'll work although I don't doubt it. Uh, I don't know whether, what kind of new populism will emerge over time. I'm sure some will, because when you have this sort of crisis, you inevitably have some very creepy, crawly uh, uh, type of political movements coming uh, uh, to the fore. But I assume it's not going to be uh, uh, today's populist. Just a final word on, on winners and losers. I don't know whether China will be a winner or a loser in relative terms in a context where everybody loses because a, a 90 percent economy, to use the economists, uh, uh, actually very astute and insightful angle, a 90 percent economy is going to be dreadful for everybody. But China will be hit, I suspect, more than most by the 90 percent economy. China was able to ensure the growth, prosperity of its medium, of its middle class, was able to ensure the lifting of the poor out of poverty, was able to limit unemployment thanks to plus 6% growth. 6% is over. IMF says very optimistically, according to the IMF itself, that China will do plus 1% a year. Uh, I don't know whether it will or it won't, but with uh, demand being incredibly depressed in the rest of the world, it's uh, very unlikely that China will be able to do more than that. How does a China with high levels of unemployment, uh, with the progress of the middle class essentially frozen, uh, without any political legit legitimacy according to, uh, along democratic lines, how will such a China evolve? For me, the parallel here is Japan, early 1930s, moving from more or less democratic development uh, to militarism, to nationalism, finding a new source of legitimacy in a poorer, angrier 
society. Uh, so the, the one forecast that I hazard is one where we have a more assertive and angrier China, and it may happen actually rather more quickly than some of the other changes which I've been, uh, I've been suggesting, in the same way that actually the first country to go sort of berserk uh, after the beginning of the Great Depression uh, was actually Japan, uh, when militarism started to unfold in uh, Manchukuo uh, as early as 1931. Uh, China has its own uh, reasons uh, uh, for uh, its own opportunities for displaying nationalism, beginning with Hong Kong, that's ongoing. There's, Xi Jinping yesterday did not mention one country, two systems. The two systems part has disappeared from public discourse in China. That's a very, very big geopolitical development. I rest my case. I was told not to mute my microphone, and then I thought I would do it because there was wind outside. But, um, uh, well, thank you, thank you very much. So uh, um, that's one winner or loser that you um, that you ended on. It was striking in your article. I just wanted to say that I mean, you 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 also talked about America um, and uh, the fact, the obvious fact that the United States was a very troubled country. Uh, before the pandemic hit, so it may it may be a revealing event in terms of what follows. Uh, you were it was hedged, but you were rather optimistic when you came to Europe, and um, I wonder. I mean, one of the things you said in your remarks just now struck me, which was that you know you've robbed populism um, by being able to erect borders. I mean, in a sense, has could this have been a obviously it's a terrible thing to happen, but it, could it be salutary in the sense that uh, European publics are reassured that their states still exist, that their, their borders actually still exist, that they can be raised, um, you know, in, in emergency? It, it's very difficult uh, uh, to say how public opinion uh, will uh, evolve over the next uh, uh, few months. Uh, but what is on display for public opinion to react to is two things. One is indeed uh, that uh, 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 the state functions and exists, and uh, even in fairly unlikely places, one of, one of, one of the most uh, remarkable performances in the fight against the pandemic happened in Greece. One of the, fa one of the smallest uh, 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 fatality rates, uh, one of the quickest reaction, and it had a lot to do with uh, both a sense of uh, national pride, but also a young and dynamic leadership. Uh, leaders, leaders actually do, do make a difference. But the other thing which is on display is that although Europe was, as usual, slow in its pan-European decision-making, that's uh, characteristic of this particular project, uh, it actually has been doing uh, the right things. And when I, when I wrote my piece, uh, I was taking a calculated risk uh, because a, uh, things could have turned out uh, very differently from the direction in which they're now uh, heading. When I wrote the piece, uh, the Merkel-Macron uh, uh, proposal uh, to set up a, a, a European recovery fund, uh, which would be backed uh, by the EU as such, uh, in effect, a mutualization of risk at the EU level. That hadn't happened yet. And I was actually personally quite stunned that it took such a decisive uh, shape. Uh, but uh, uh, that was a good surprise. But I, I was actually much less fearful than others as to the general di direction in which we would be going. Uh, uh, so, you know, I said, my piece that we were going to, uh, that Europe was going to be one of the big geopolitical surprises. Either it blows up, it disintegrates, or it becomes more integrated. But muddling, muddling through is, ac is actually not on the table. That was my, my basic thrust, and, uh, and I stand by that.
uh, we may yet disintegrate. I mean, I mean I'm, uh, I'm not usually very good at optimism. I, I tend to be better when I, uh, uh, when, when I prognosticate terrible things happening. Uh, but still, uh, the Europeans uh, have been doing relatively well collectively and individually often very well. I mean, not, not everybody, of course, has been, has been doing well. Uh, Italy, and, Italy and France uh, uh, and Spain uh, being the, out, uh, the negative outliers here. Uh, but overall, I think we have uh, some chance of uh, uh, moving in the right direction in the framework of this crisis. For the states, as, as, as for so many other things with this pandemic, uh, what we see is not necessarily new stuff. Uh, 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 the divisions, the polarization of American society, uh, you all know them by heart. They were not created by the pandemic uh, and uh, they were always going to be extraordinarily difficult to manage uh, uh, with or, or after Trump. Uh, uh, but uh, the pandemic, if anything, has seems to me, but I'm, I'm far away from the States physically. Uh, uh, it seems to me that the pandemic has done nothing uh, to uh, heal uh, or to bring together uh, some of the divisions uh, uh, in American society. This is, this is actually quite, quite scary because normally the first response uh, to an act of aggression and the virus is aggressing us uh, is actually uh, to tend to respond, uh, to respond together, uh, in the, the states has responded the, at, at the top level and sometimes at the state level, uh, uh, the Americans have responded in, a, in in their usually polarized uh, manner. That's that's not encouraging. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, let's in fact go to the United States now, at least physically, uh, to um, Doctor <coughs> Ball. Ball um, I mean, in a certain sense, your article is hopeful, or at least it's hopeful about a certain segment of, of, of the international and particularly the American response. And that is that the pace of scientific research um, in response to this crisis has been extraordinary, uh, even in comparison to recent uh, scares like Ebola, Ebola uh, SARS, or, or the flu outbreaks earlier in, the, in this century. And I guess that's, as you write, that's partly because of technology. For example, scientists don't actually need to get their hands on physical virus samples right now because of, 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 of advances. Um, but you also note that the possibility of a disease emergency has been imagined by this scientific community and warned about by this scientific community repeatedly. And yet at some level, we still seem to have suffered from a failure of imagination. So how, how do you explain that? Thank you. Well, first, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I, uh, so yes, a failure of imagination that harkens back to the conclusion of the 9-11 Commission. They had, a number, um, they had a number of specific recommendations. We need to have biometrics. We need to make sure that fire and police can talk to each other. But overall, in their report, they said that we had a failure of imagination, and that is clearly not the case here. We have imagined this particular future repeatedly, and, um, and we've, we've prepared for it. We've had tabletop exercises. We've even put language into important strategic documents. But for some reason, it didn't, it didn't pan out. What I focus on in the article, the optimism, is on the international scientific collaboration piece. And, and that performed better than anything um, in the response to date. Um, and, and that's not an accident. And so I, got, I go into that in the, in the article. So a lot of times when we're talking about COVID, we, we hearken back to 1918 and, um, and to try and draw lessons from, from, that, uh, from that last terrible pandemic that killed upwards of 50 or 100 million people. Um, but, you know, I teach a class on, on 1918 flu and the public health lessons learned. I've taught it for the last several years. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's useful as a tool to get people to imagine 
that, you know, that they're faced with this terrible pandemic and that, you know, people were people just like then, that, you know, that they too could be part of a global response like that was. Um, but it's, you know, it's possible to overdraw those comparisons and, um, and when it, and that, and no more um, is that uh, more uh, stark than in technology um, and the science and technology response. Um, you mentioned that now we can download samples, um, the sequence of, of the viruses, uh, and you don't need to have the physical samples like we did in SARS in 2003. But um, it goes so much further than that. This was a research project in real time by performed by scientists all over the world. And this is, um, there have been maybe eight or 9,000 uh, papers published to date. There are thousands of, of virus strains that have been sequenced. There are 160 plus vaccine and therapy candidates in the pipeline. Um, it's, it's really just extraordinary. And the communication um, that scientists have uh, put their research onto preprint servers so that they could learn from each other important pieces in real time. We're developing um, a knowledge of the correlates of immunity. Um, and all of this will make the idea of having a vaccine in the next couple of years possible. It just wouldn't happen without this international work. And that is, um, and that's extraordinary. So, but the optimism about this only goes so far. Um, to, to be clear, the COVID has been a catastrophe for the world and um, for the US in particular, it reflects very poorly on our national security. Um, we're, in addition to the lives lost, their uh, military readiness has been degraded, our economic power has dwindled, um, the ability to handle disease threats um, must seem very um, interesting to people who might wish to use biology to cause harm um, because clearly uh, systems are not in place to be able to deter such threats. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that is a, a major concern for the future. And so why is that? Well, one, one thing that I put forward is that national security um, you know, that has not included health security to the extent that it should. Um, health security has been incorporated into high-level strategies. In, in my article, I quote from the 2018 National Security strategy, strategy from the Trump administration, which has the correct language about how, what could cause, you know, diseases, what they could, um, what havoc they could uh, cause on uh, our economic power, on our military readiness, et cetera. Um, I could also quote from other strategy documents like the 20, 2019 biodefense strategy. The words are there, but the budgets tell a completely different story. And um, the, there have been cuts at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. There have been cuts at health security programs at the Department of Defense. And, um, and we all have heard about the World Health Organization, um, the, the moves to, to defund the, the WHO and, and to um, be antagonistic towards their mission. So what I suggest we need to do is that, um, I mean, scientific expertise is critical for handling not only health security um, crises, but other ones as well. Um, but even though the, there is a particular problem in the lack of trust of scientific expertise and the lack of um, using science for making decisions, this problem is, is a little bit more longstanding and needs to be corrected after COVID. Um, there, there's, it's all too much, all too often um, when people come into national security positions, they don't have pandemics as part of their training. They don't have um, the, the um, disease, um, HIV AIDS was a first case example in the, um, in the national security uh, impl uh, implications of, of disease. But it's, you know, it, it should be a greater portion of the way that diseases are, um, that national security uh, officials are trained. It's just very easy if a health um, issue comes up like this one to say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's Department of Health and Human Services job. That's not, that's not something we need to deal with um, 
for, you know, we're, we're going to think more strategically about geopolitics and, and disease doesn't necessarily need to be part of that. The other thing um, that I suggest is that we need to have, um, we need to capitalize on what went well for this, uh, this crisis and expand on it to prepare for the next one. International scientific collaboration is, it's not an accident that we are in a position where we can even talk about having um, uh, the possibility of a vaccine maybe at the end of next year, if we're very lucky, but certainly at some point in the next few years, we will have a vaccine. Um, there, there's, you know, that it takes work to build this kind of international uh, uh, response. And, um, and so we happen to have the pieces in place to be able to, to jump on these transborder threats. I, there are lots of different programs that are valuable for scientific um, collaboration. I mentioned one in particular, the Biological Threat Reduction Program, which came out of the Nunn-Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction um, work. And that program is, it's perennially on the chopping block um, when it comes to budgets, but um, they struggle to, to quantify the impact that they've had and point to individual successes like having a diagnostic laboratory in West Africa that was able to um, switch quickly from loss of fever to Ebola in the early days of 2014. But I mean, it's hard to, to quantify something that is so important that builds trust and builds scientific uh, ties between scientists um, in the US and, all, and scientists all over the world. And other countries have similar types of programs. And the value of those um, just can't be overstated, especially when you think about where we would be without the collaborations between Chinese scientists and US and European scientists. Um, to uh, where we would, he, would we be for diagnostic tests or possible treatments or possible vaccine candidates. So all of those things are quite priceless. And um, we, but we, while we don't know what the next crisis is going to be, we're, it's, uh, there, there are a lot of crises that can be imagined that are transborder that would require scientific um, scientists all over the world to, to jump on it and to work on it in real time. And so we need to make sure we're ready for that. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I don't want to be a downer, but um, I, I just since, since since the bedrock of optimism in your in your case is is this this world of science of international global scientific cooperation. Um, what's the reaction of that community going to be? to political enmity. I mean, I'm, you know, there's a war of words between, at least a war of words ongoing now between China and the United States. Um, will uh, scientific cooperation continue unbothered by that or, or, or is that a danger to it? I think, I mean, so scientists, uh, I'm thinking back to uh, the Cold War, the, um, there, there were scientific collaborations between the U.S. and the Soviet Union um, that were very valuable in, in making, uh, I don't, the science may or may not have been as valuable as the di diplomatic ties um, and just keeping a line of communication open that is not political um, is it's very important. And I, I think m many scientists are pretty apolitical and, and only uh, serve, you know, the, um, the needs of, of finding more information. I think um, the kinds of political considerations need to be in the, in the heads of uh, the administrators of such scientific programs. But, um, and, you know, some boundaries may need to, to be made. I mean, thinking of intellectual property and everything else. But, um, but the, the value of scientists working together is, I think, an inherent good and systems can be put into place that, um, that you know, don't sidestep the political uh, issues, but nonetheless allow uh, fruitful um, science to continue. Good, thank you. Well, let's, uh, let's turn now to Britain where uh, Professor Friedman and I both sit. Um, uh, Laura, you served on the official inquiry into the Britain's involvement in the Iraq War. And as you note, there are expectations of a similar inquiry 
I mean, almost a certainty, as I understand it, of a similar inquiry uh, into this crisis. Um, and you also note that one of the grounding principles of, of that previous inquiry was to develop a reliable account influenced as little as possible by the benefit of hindsight. Um, I, I suppose that's difficult. I mean, you know, there, there, there's so much hindsight already being applied. Uh, there's so much fear, judgment, and crucially, which you do get into in your piece, you know, an obvious um, tendency or instinct towards national comparisons between different national responses. Um, but in any event, one thing you found for your very uh, detailed article was that even at this early stage, there's a wealth of primary source material, uh, you know, in, in what I gather is just regular government reporting. So tell us a little bit about what you learned from it. Well, thanks. And again, thanks for the invitation, indeed, the opportunity to write the piece uh, in the first place, which uh, uh, I wrote a book a couple of years ago about the, uh, the difficulty of making predictions about war and how everybody always got it wrong anyway. So I went back to being a historian and uh, easy to try to work out how we got to where we are and where we're going in the future. Um, and as you say, there are, it, it's not just the, the normal primary sources, uh, but you know, select committee hearings, government statements and so on. But actually the government did put out uh, on a website a lot of the scientific studies that went into framing the government response so you could read those and you could follow up the footnotes and it, it, it all told you could you i think it's possible to put together a picture which will undoubtedly change over time because what we don't have at the moment are the inner workings of government the actual conversations that took place at ministerial level but we can work out a lot because we know quite a lot of scientific inputs we know quite a lot about the policy outputs uh, and, and there's not hard to work out the relationship between the two so that's what i tried to do and i think it's interesting and, and uh because i think it warns us um uh about facile coming to facile conclusions uh and i think that there's a there's a lot more we still need to know uh and there's a tendency in the uk uh, to assume that the only two other countries that had a problem were germany and south korea um, uh, and uh, as we did terribly against both of those, therefore this points to the policy interventions we missed. And you, you know, there's lots of countries that have actually quite a similar experience to the UK. And actually when you look at the UK, as you look at France or the US, it's patchy. Some parts did okay, got off, uh, still got, I mean, who knows what will happen next. Other parts, uh, big cities in particular, have had a terrible time. Um, and so, uh, as we get a more granular understanding of what happened, I think a lot of the critiques will, will change. But anyway, what, what, what have we learned? First, um, two awkward points. Uh, we learned lessons from the past pandemic. We just happened to learn the wrong ones. Um, so while Asia learned the lessons from SARS, that they were close to China, uh, and if China had a problem um, with uh, with animal to human transmission, it was likely to become human to human transmission and get to them quite quickly. Um, our lesson from SARS is it didn't reach us. Um, while uh, in, in 2009, you had the swine flu pandemic and everybody got uh, very excited and the, uh, and the WHO rushed almost to, to call it a pandemic. In the end, to quote a, a UK uh, source, it was a damp squid, not a lot happened. And you can see in the in the um, in the policies immediately afterwards that we, in, in plans which lasted to the present day, uh, a belief first that um, don't just you know, if, you, if you just go for the worst case, you won't be ready for the cases that happened. That influenza was a bigger problem than the more exotic forms of viruses, um, and um, and that, that lasted until we, we weren't. The modelling was was based on a big influenza epidemic, it, it, and uh, not necessarily exactly what's happened. So we learned lessons, um, learned them quite quite well. Uh, just unfortunately, they they weren't necessarily uh, 
appropriate to that time. Secondly, our system for acquiring and transmitting scientific advice is pretty good. Uh, it's quite well established. Um, the crisis management system for government is pretty well established. It goes back uh, in, in fact to foot and mouth disease. Uh, it, it, so it, it's, it's all there and it, and it, and it, it, it operated in, in the ways that it should. We just didn't always come out with the right decisions. Um, so it tells us that lesson learning and right processes don't always produce the right outcomes. And that's always a salutary thing to realize. What else? We got, I think one of the differences, and this goes back to some of the things that Gigi was saying, but one of the differences with previous pandemics is um, the for the UK, in pandemics as well as everything else, we tend to look to the US, um, and the US wasn't there. I mean, the CDC's own tests didn't work, um, the, 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 the administration was play, playing it down. Where I say with Ebola, the US and the UK work quite closely together. Uh, this just wasn't happening. Equally, you had, a, you had uh, the main culprit, if you like, denying it was a culprit and holding back on information. Uh, and I think, you know, even with scientific responses now, there's worries that Chinese papers are being censored to, to stick with the narrative that it wasn't so much their fault. Uh, and then you have WHO losing credibility because it was so close. So the international context was extraordinarily unfortunate this time. Uh, in other circumstances, if if those if China, the US, and the WHO, the WHO had been performing more effectively, um, other countries, not just let's talk about the UK here, would have had probably better experiences as well. The, the WHO should have called this out much more strongly, I think, more quickly. And, and you can say that without supporting Trump's call to defund it, which is is a stupid response to a problem, but there was undoubtedly a problem. So what specifically, um, I mean, a lot of the things also the UK has done is, have not been, uh, some of the ways that the state has responded have been fine. Um, there's some quite good initiatives, the economic initiative has been fine. But in the, in the, the first half of March, we sort of lost the plot a bit. Uh, and we lost the plot, um, I think, be, uh, and, and you know we'll, we'll need to understand more about this because the scientific advice was um, more optimistic, not about whether or not we'd be hit. It was clear we were going to be hit, or that we could be hit badly. But the speed with which it was happening. Um, if you look at the materials from early March, all the measures are being discussed, all the ideas are there, but there's a sense that we've got time. Um, that the, the we can introduce this gradually. And the issue was raised in the discussions about do you go for uh, throwing everything at the problem or do you do it in a sort of in ways strategists understand sort of flexible response uh, rather than big bang. And we, and we started to go for flexible response. Uh, and there's all sorts of specific missteps you can, you can talk about in this. But um, include uh, one problem which we had, we had the, the annual budget in the middle of of all the discussions and that took up political attention at an awkward time. But I think the problem was um, that we were too slow to pick up on uh, the impact on the lessons of Italy, if you like. It was only as data came through from Italy in a way that the modelers could use that they started to appreciate just how bad this could be. And there's an argument, we just come into the UK debate since I wrote my piece, which is, uh, that actually an awful lot of the disease was coming into the UK in early March, largely as people were coming back from Italy from half-term holidays and, and Spain as well. That's where UK people try, tend to go. So uh, that's an interesting twist. But the fact is that while other countries, starting with the Italian lockdown on the 9th, um, were, um, were moving quite quickly, Germans shutting down Berlin, um, uh, big events being cancelled, schools being closed. UK did very little that week, the week beginning the ninth. Um, what did happen is individuals were doing their own thing. Uh, social distancing was taking place spontaneously, if you like. Um, matches were being, the football association closed down the soccer season, not the government. Um, 
And then the government suddenly realized actually had a bigger problem. The modeling came back and said, this is going faster than you thought. So uh, they, had to, they had to switch. Uh, and they, once they switched, they did so. Um, uh, and there was this sort of movement in, in announcement from the 16th to the 23rd. And although it's now presented as we didn't have lockdown till the 23rd, if you look at all the uh, evidence that's coming in now, actually, in practice, it was starting, uh, in fact, before the government announcement, but it certainly started on the 16th. And you see uh, dramatic falls in the use of public transport and people going out and uh, uh, job shutting, university shutting. Um, so the, what happened, though, I, I think, was that public opinion and public practice was ahead of the government. The government ended up following rather than leading. And then it caught up. Um, and as Francois said before, um, we now have the, uh, the big problem uh, that you, you can sort of actually go into lockdown with great clarity, but you come out of it with enormous confusion. Uh, and nobody's quite sure what the appropriate response is. And the government messaging is not clear because it wants, it actually wants people to be careful, but it wants them to go to work and so on. The other thing that's worth mentioning um, is um, the care home problem. Um, I mean, I think what has been staggering to discover, um, especially given that we could see this and what had happened to all other European countries, um, was, um, and it's not clear whether this was the advice or the individual responses of local health authorities or care homes, that a lot of the burden of the problem was shifted from hospitals to care homes, which is a sense of moving people out, uh, or people out. Um, and the, the, the problems that we faced with protective equipment and testing uh, had a terrible impact on, on, on not just the, uh, the healthcare setting, but, but particularly in the social care setting. Now, some of these problems are, are now much better and have been resolved. And, and that side of the uh, epidemic is being brought down. But if you look at the figures, um, the, the, they're quite horrendous uh, for what has happened in, in care homes. Um, and if you look at the scientific analysis and the advice and the modeling, um, the focus is on ICUs and hospitals. It doesn't mention care homes. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not part of the modeling. Um, and uh, if I was drawing one lesson, it, it would be that. And I think it's actually going to be one of the big conclusions that's unavoidable after this is that we somehow have to bring our hopeful health and social care systems um, much better together. Just, uh, just as a final point, uh, just go back to what I said before, we're learning more and more about this as we go along. Um, and I mean, again, Francois made the correct point that our geopolitical prognostications sort of change monthly. I think we're sort of a bit more, I agree with him, we're a bit more down on China now than seemed the case a, a month or so ago. Um, and Gigi said the, the scientific uh, work is, is quite exceptional. Um, and, but the, but it, it strikes me that we've got a bit of cacophony of advice at the moment. The, 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 what in some ways we lack is a clearinghouse for the studies in some ways to give us a sense of which of the of the many studies that suggest very different things um which are seized on by newspapers uh because they one of the things you also learn about this is not only do people not understand the difference between correlation and causation they've got no understanding of statistics absolutely not and they sort of you know you, you try to explain the r rate uh, and why it actually it'd be much more volatile when the numbers go down and then people assume it's just to tell you about the scale of uh, how many cases you've got rather than just how many. so it, i mean if I, one conclusion after after bringing health and social care closer together i teach statistics at school uh, <laughs> much better because it, it, it's uh, but but it adds to this problem it, which is that we have lots of headlines about the science um, but we don't actually ha have an awful lot of authority at the moment telling us quite where we are because the people who do know are pr properly very cautious. <laughs>
uh, and don't want to start saying we've got a cure or we know what to do. And that's leaving the way open, not for people who are being uh, sort of snake oil snail salesmen, although you have a president that does that, um, but um, just the sort of thing, just to take one example from France, this sort of study that somehow smoking helped, which is nonsense. Um, um, but um, you could, it takes a lot of disentangling to work out why that is. Meanwhile, we have a lot of happy, happy smokers. Um, so anyway, that, 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 <laughs> there's some very uh, broad and loose conclusions to come to end with. Is it just me, or is it, does it seem that some of the crazier ideas that you find in the fever swamps of the United States seem to originate in France? Um, I mean, they're obviously... Uh, I wouldn't possibly comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, I wanted to ask you not about France, which um, there might be a lot to say about, given that it's had, um, it's had an interesting bifurcation between uh, a political response and an actual, you know, fairly serious um, suffering from the disease. But on Britain, uh, before we leave it, you were very, very careful in this article. I mean, it was, it was a very sober article at a time when there were a lot of polemics going on. I mean, one thing that I, for example, I mean, it may not be such a big deal now, but as you were writing it, and as I was looking at early drafts, you were you discounted this whole notion that there was ever really a going to be a herd immunity strategy, which caused a lot of consternation in a lot of places. Um, but I still need to ask, was there a sense, I mean, this, this is getting a little bit away from the facts, I suppose, from, from the hard data, but was, was there a, and, and so maybe you don't even want to answer it, but was there a, was there a factor of British exceptionalism uh, that 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 was guiding government debate and and government response? I mean, you know, not to stretch too far, but the subject of British exceptionalism has been been in the uh, been in the in the air for the last four or five years for obvious reasons. Um. There's a bit, I wouldn't overstate it. I mean, th th there was a tendency to boast about our scientific response and so on, uh, which has been, you know, a lot of the scientific response, you know, a lot of very good stuff is going on in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, it's not idle boasting, but, you know, as, as the casualties grew, the, the boasting sort of was played down a bit. I don't think herd immu the herd immunity, I mean, the Swedes are the one who've gone for the exceptional response on herd immunity, with not particularly happy results, I would say. Um, but the, the, the herd immunity is a, is, a, is a different problem. I think the problem there was a term that's very well known in epidemiology. It's a, it's a, perfect, it's a very legitimate issue. It's a really important issue because if we don't have immunity developing one way or the other, preferably through a vaccine, then, then this wretched thing will keep on coming back to uh, until we do have herd immunity, but a lot of people dead. Um, the problem was the I, I think it, it, my, my view, which, which is it's not generally, I'm not sure it's generally accepted despite my efforts, is that this was a very flawed attempt to explain why the policy of cocooning people like me, old people, uh, in order to just shield them from the disease, could go hand in hand with allowing big public events to go ahead. Um, so it, it was a very brief attempt before these public events got closed down anyway, to explain why that might not be such a bad thing. Um, it only lasted a couple of days. Uh, it was disavowed by the health minister almost immediately as not a driver of policy, but it took root because uh, people were, were happy about policy. You certainly felt, you know, it was an explanation of why we hadn't done very much. I just don't think it was the right explanation. I think the right explanation was that we thought we had more time, um, but if you look at the uh, at all the you know the graphs that were in the in the uh, papers presented uh, to the scientific advisory committee, uh, they've got this, these waves. All the epidemiological um, modelling has these waves, and the, the assumption was that whatever you suppressed in the first wave would come out in the second wave. So there was always an issue there. It's just you couldn't let the first wave get out of hand because the hospitals couldn't cope. Uh, and, that, and that was what drove policy 
it, it, it wasn't um, uh, and why we moved pretty quickly when we realized that, that it was uh, more exponential than had been realized. Okay, uh, thank, thank you all very much. Um, I had a big question I wanted to ask all of you, uh, but I think I'm gonna save it because I do wanna allow um, uh, some um, participation from our audience. I'm gonna start as someone who raised her hand and then I think has put it down and decided to put her question in writing. Um, I'm, it's the first opportunity I have to speak to her since the last time I spoke to her, she was my boss. And that's Corey Shockey, who is now at the American Enterprise Institute in the United States. And her question to Lawrence Friedman is, how serious a problem for China do you think the international inquiry Australia is calling for will be? Um, and what does it say about the prospects for middle power cooperation when great powers are not leading? Well, that could bring me back to my question about British excep exceptionalism, but anyway. Uh, well, I have a question for Francois as well. Um, uh, I think well, I, Ch China uh, can have as many, be as many inquiries as you like. And uh, uh, you know, there's an inquiry after SARS. Uh, China promised not to do the same thing again, and the same thing happened. Uh, so uh, uh, they shut down, uh, you know, they, they banned people eating uh, wild animals and so on. So uh, they've done that before as well. So we, we, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think there's, you know, my, I think it's important that Chan has not been able to get away with the idea that it was nothing to do with them. Um, and that would have been um, unfortunate. And they have to address those issues. Um, the other thing, the only other point I would I'd make about about China, which is, uh, I think reinforces Francois's point, is the, the effect of this on the Belt and Road. Um, the amount of debt um, mm -hmm. that China is now owed is staggering from countries that can't afford to repay it. And it is going to be faced with some really awkward decisions over the next uh, months and years about does it forgive this debt? I don't think it can, doesn't, they don't want to do that. Does it uh, seize assets? Well, that's going to make it unpopular. Um, does it force these countries to pay? They can't. Uh, and I think that this, as much as the, um, the confrontation with the US, which um, you know, sort of rises and falls, and we'll, we'll see how that develops. But I think this is actually a much trickier set of problems for them because this was a controversial program in Beijing to start with. Um, and I think it uh, adds to the sense that you know, as we cope with the health lessons and, and health consequences, the economic consequences of this are probably going to outdo by, by some distance the, uh, the health consequences of Francois. Francois, do you want to, I mean, both, I mean, since you have some views on China, I know, um, but also this middle powers adrift question, I think is an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, if you can repeat to me uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes uh, what the middle power question was, because I, I'm afraid I missed that. Uh, on China, uh, uh, several things. Uh, of course, one shouldn't uh, uh, simply beat up on China because it's always comforting uh, to be able to beat up on somebody uh, under these circumstances. And, and China really, really looks uh, the part. Uh, uh, but uh, what, why does the China thing really matter? Uh, why should the Australians, uh, the European Union, uh, and all sorts of other countries, including Russia, a, uh, go for this uh, uh, international inquiry with China finally having to pretend to accept it. Uh, 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 several things. First of all, uh, yes, the Chinese uh, uh, use their influence in the WHO and to delay uh, the emergency at practically every stage until March 11th uh, of this year. Uh, the WHO is taken quite seriously by very many countries, uh, uh, and in France in particular, uh, 
uh, the WHO is remembered in particular because of the role played by uh, uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland during this, uh, the SARS epidemic of, two, of 2003. Uh, 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 we simply hadn't realized that it had become a very different organization. Uh, so that was the first problem posed by China. Second problem posed by China uh, uh, were, of course, the figures. A, uh, I think the working assumption in France in the scientific community and by spillover into the political community was, well, the Chinese scientists are honest and don't uh, tend to uh, act politically. I don't know whether that's true or not, but the fact of the matter is that they gave us figures for Wuhan and Hubei, uh, which seem to be completely out of kilter with what really happened. I mean, all all of the uh, uh, data which was collected subsequently, notably on the number of cremations uh, uh, and burials in the province of Hupei, tend to indicate that Hupei was probably as badly hit as Northern Italy subsequently was. Instead of that, we get this, initially we get this silly 3,000 uh, uh, dead people uh, figure, which was eventually increased by uh, 50.0 percent, which was suspiciously precise, uh, uh, and therefore it wasn't as bad as it appeared to be. Uh, and that also helped delay our own uh, our own response. And our public opinions and our political opinion uh, are simply not going to to rest. Uh, the point on. Uh, 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 Belt and Road uh, and on China's unconditionality policy. Uh, yes, China has lent money with no strings attached to some of the worst people in the worst places in the world. And, uh, but uh, if, the, if there were no political strings attached, there certainly were commercial strings attached. And we now see that in the G20, the country which has been dragging its feet the most to prevent debt relief in the developing countries uh, is, uh, is China. Uh, uh, that, that does not bode well. There's another element to the China equation, which I, I, I think people maybe haven't focused on nearly enough, and I'm not a China expert, uh, but, I, but I have noticed this. Uh, China barely has a stimulus plan. Uh, in 2008, 2009, uh, China managed to sustain a plus 6% growth rate despite the global financial crisis. And indeed, China played a material role in preventing the recession from becoming a global depression. Th that was actually China's finest hour as a responsible stakeholder to use the formulation of people like Bob Zollick, Bob Zollick at the time. Uh, there is no sign of this happening in, in, in China. Uh, the Chinese central bank uh, doesn't seem to be nearly as active uh, as other central banks uh, uh, in the States, in the European Union, in Britain, or in India. Uh, uh, so the margins of maneuver in China appear to be somewhat, uh, somewhat limited. That's also an interesting point. Does this reassure me? No, it doesn't. Uh, a hungry, angry China is, uh, uh, may well be uh, what we get. And when I follow what is going on in Hong Kong, I am very, very, very worried. Uh, because once you destroy the conceptual framework, which the Chinese and the international community put together in the 70s, where we managed to put Hong Kong and Taiwan with different statuses onto the uh, uh, back burner as strategic concerns. Once one country, two systems uh, was a remarkable formula. Uh, the Chinese accepted to live with an unsatisfactory solution. We accepted to live with a, an in-between solution, which is intellectually not very clean. Uh, but the overall outcome was peace, stability, and prosperity in East Asia. Uh, that may well now be going down uh, the tubes. If I can add just a word, uh, Dana. Uh, on what uh, said about uh, the fact that this had been imagined before. I confirmed that. Uh, uh, I was involved in pandemic preparation in France uh, 15 years ago. Uh, we then uh, were prepping for interhuman transmission uh, 
of bird flu H, H5 and 1, uh, which, which in its phenomenology would have looked a lot like what we're having. And in January, February, I had the impression of seeing the movie uh, for which I had seen the trailer 15 years before. Uh, 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 it was so familiar in so many ways. Uh, there was no failure of imagination. Uh, there was simply a lack of proximity in time and space. Countries which were relatively close, like Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore, I take very different countries, uh, all did much better than even the best Europeans. Anybody who was far away from the theater uh, didn't react nearly as promptly uh, uh, and with the same suite of instantly available instruments as the countries which had not forgotten, forgotten about SARS, which had not forgotten the muscle memory of SARS and MERS. Uh, that's not a geopolitical divide, that's a geographical one. And not presumably, as some people were quick to assume, a cultural divide, but I mean... Well, New Zealand is not a Western country, that's well known. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, Gigi, uh, I don't know if you want to... Um, I mean, a, a, an issue has been raised about the um, integrity, in, in a sense, of the scientific collaboration um, between involving China. And I, I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I actually wanted to say something about WHO and, um, and the various sources of information. Um, but WHO is a pretty underpowered um, organization. And Gro Harlan Brundtland, actually, uh, we, we had a tabletop exercise um, years ago called uh, Atlantic Storm where she played the director of the World Health Organization and Madeleine Albright played the president of the United States. Um, and we, you know, and she, she described the budget of the WHO as being equivalent to a small British hospital. And, and so, you know, and, uh, but what, what is, so it's got a certain role and it has to, um, it has to use the diplomatic ties that it ha you know, that, it, that are available. It has a certain diplomatic role but other countries power that organization. And so there are experts that are at the WHO that are from France, that are from the British government, that are from the US government. So the, um, the ability to hear what is the ground truth versus what the WHO um, says is, is there. It's not the only, it's not also not the only source of information. There's a lot of other ways that information about what was going on in Wuhan could have been accessed by different countries. So I think it's just, um, it's too convenient to blame uh, WHO for, for failure to warn when they're, when one of their main missions is to make sure that, uh, that ties are, are maintained with, with China and that China gives the information that they can. Um, I, I, I'm not going to defend WHO's uh, actions with my dying breath, but like, you know, they're, they're not the only um, the player involved. As far as the scientific collaboration um, and the integrity of the um, Chinese science, um, I mean, this is, this is uh, there's, there's a responsibility for people who are administrating the science and the scientific programs, um, and they should have different uh, larger senses of knowledge about what other factors could be influencing the science. Um, uh, sometimes that's beyond the scope of the people who are actually doing the science. Okay, okay. thank you very much. I'm gonna go to um, somebody who has raised his hand, um, who wants to ask a question directly. That's Peter Watkins. Okay. I was very interested by um, Professor Grobel's point about when we're thinking about future strategies, um, why don't we capitalize on what went well? And I just wondered whether there's anything that um, goes beyond just the scientific collaboration there. I also wondered whether when we're looking at all this and future strategies, we don't need to completely rethink our approach to contingency planning across government. I mean, in the defense world, 
world, he um, invests a lot of money into trying to um, avoid things that uh, um, things from happening. I mean, we accept that we spend a lot of money on equipment and exercise and so on that may never actually be used. And doesn't that approach need to be now adopted more widely? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> for years, we have been saying that you know, for just one, the cost of an eighth of an aircraft carrier, you could have you know, such better public health responses and you can have people who can uh, discard the fax machines in their offices to get, um, to get infant case counts from local hospitals for reportable diseases. So yes, we should, um, there should be some fat in the system that, um, that as opposed to the, where we are today. Um, I think what, what's challenging about the, the science is that even though much of it is funded by government, um, biology has grown up in the private sector and the applications are largely in the private sector. And so that is a different, um, that is, it has some differences uh, compared to other, um, other technologies um, that, you know, that may have, uh, that may be of use for governments. And so get there for the government to get what it wants, um, a different approach, approaches need to be um, followed. Let me, wait a minute. Uh, I don't know, let, let me, actually that raises a question, or it, that, that, that comes to the big question I was gonna ask, which I'm gonna pose and hope that people can respond to um, that we have time at the end, but then I wanna move on to somebody else in the audience. But my big question, which has been raised in a certain sense or, or, or directly raised by Gigi a couple of times now, um, is, is in a certain sense uh, inspired by a, a previous article in Survival in the, in, the, in the last but one issue by Anatole Levin called Climate Change in, in the State. Um, a case for environmental re realism. And Anatole is both an environmentalist who sees climate change as an ex existential threat to humankind and a realist who is wary of, you know, sort of the securitization, what we call securitization of human welfare issues. In other words, there's strategy and then there's human welfare and they need to be sort of understood somewhat um, differently. But he does come to the view that climate change needs to be ranked with for example, nuclear strategic matters, uh, precisely because it threatens the legitimacy and potentially the existence of states. So that's a long-winded way of asking if we have time for you guys to think about the question of whether this crisis, whether when we emerge from this crisis, you know, we're gonna actually have a reordering of, of our hierarchy of threats, if we look at it this way, and, and how we look at you know, security and strategy um, writ large. But before, um, so I asked that question thinking, expecting you may not have time to answer it, but be ready to if you do. Um, Andrew Cote at, at uh, University College Cork asks, how far have international institutions, uh, the UN, G7, G20, WHO, which we've talked about, how have the, to what extent have they been undermined by this crisis? And are they likely to recover over time? Uh, who would like to take that? Francois. Uh, it's, the system is in crisis because the United States is no longer interested in the system. That's, the very, that's my very short reaction uh, to, uh, to the question. Uh, the WHO, uh, has been largely hijacked by China, and I, I'm, I'm more severe on this than Gigi is. Uh, a, 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 there is nothing good to say about, about the WHO's uh, 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 a response uh, to the initial stages of the, uh, of, of, of the epidemic. Uh, a, a, uh, but if there's something wrong with the WHO, you take charge of it. Uh, who has the money? Not China. Most of the WHO's budget comes from U uh, the United States and Europe. Uh, so, uh, you want to set it right, you can, but the United States is not interested. Indeed, the United States was totally uninterested in the Australian-European 
uh, 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 resolution uh, to, uh, to get the WHO to investigate China. Uh, uh, this is what is wrong. Uh, you take the G20, uh, uh, the US is part of it, uh, uh, and uh, I'm not sure its role is particularly nefarious, but it doesn't seem to have been particularly prominent either. The only area in which things seem to have been working, as they were designed to work from 1944 onwards, uh, is in the financial monetary uh, uh, arena, uh, the interface between uh, the Fed, uh, 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 the Bank of England, and the European Central Bank has been extremely has been extremely close. Uh, this similar decisions were taken quickly. Uh, uh, big, big bazookas came out of the cupboard uh, very quickly, which is another way of answering the question. That is, uh, when the system works, you notice it as well. The problem is that it's, uh, uh, it, it is no longer working. Dana, do, do you want me to try to answer your question or not? Because sure. you know, but, uh, let, let me have a stab. Uh, First of all, on the securization aspect. If it's as bad as war, it's going to be handled like war. In war, what do you get? You take uh, the United Kingdom, for example, which has a long and distinguished history in this field. Uh, you get the Defense of the Realm Act. You get uh, administrative internment. Uh, you get things which are very unpleasant for individual liberty while remaining a democracy, while remaining a democracy. This was done in order to make it possible for democracy to triumph. So this is, this is not in any way a critique, on the contrary. But uh, if climate change is going to be as big a challenge as war, and I, I tend to agree with uh, uh, Anatole on this, uh, then yes, you're going to have some very unpleasant things happening, like people having an individual CO2 accounts. For people who used to travel, like Laurie and myself, and I suspect Gigi, not to mention you, Dana, uh, this will be very painful because our carbon balances will be very, very, very quickly depleted uh, by, our, uh, by the seminars we would like to go to in pleasant places. Uh, 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 does this cramp individual liberty? You bet it does. It'll be very unpleasant. Uh, but I suspect it will be unavoidable if the analysis made is correct. Uh, should it be handled like war? Should pandemic preparations be handled like war? Here we come back to the point made by Gigi earlier on. Uh, the answer is, is indeed yes. Uh, Britain and France, and we did so many things in parallel, and actually we were talking a lot to each other after 9-11. And we both decided at about the same time to have national security strategies of which defense would be only one part. David, all, David uh, 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 our, our good British friends were deeply involved in that, and we were involved in that. Uh, uh, and yes, for a time, it seemed as if we were going to deal with pandemic preparation the same way we were dealing with defense preparation. And then we all forgot, literally forgot. We did not renew our stocks of uh, PPE. Uh, we ended up in the same sort of mess as the Brits on, on many accounts. We made the same mistakes in the handling of the pandemic, by the way. We also enjoyed the same successes in terms of the hospital system not breaking down. That, that is something which distinguished both countries, uh, notwithstanding Britain's uh, much larger death toll uh, from, uh, from, let's say, Italy or Spain. Uh, uh, and in the case of climate change, uh, yes, uh, we will have to deal with this as a national security issue, broadly defined. Laurie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, to add. Um, I think there's an issue of, of state capacity um, and governmental capacity. I mean, you know, it, these things stretch governments to their limit. Uh, and uh, it's quite interesting to see how it, how you galvanize the system in order to produce reason. I mean, for example, on testing, uh, we, we, where we started, the UK started off perfectly well and then lost the plot and then recovered the plot and now not doing so badly. 
uh, and it required you know people going in with extraordinary powers to to but but knew who knew what they were talking about. Um, uh, and I think in the US, I mean, Peter, you can talk about this, but the question of uh, of capacity was a big question because so many key positions in government just hadn't been filled. Um, and so you end up with Jared Kushner having his mates come in to, to try to do the same thing, not necessarily very successfully. Secondly, there's an issue of resilience, um, which I think is the planning point and Peter Watkins' point. Uh, we run our health service uh on the edge because people care about uh the frontline services rather than what's in the background and, uh, and stocks and supplies and contingencies because contingency planning costs money um and if you don't have that much money and it's a choice between that and hospital beds hospital beds win um so uh i think that's a change i think one of the positive things uh is um extraordinary social solidarity. I mean, uh, uh, in the UK, I think we've been quite impressed and staggered by how much people appreciated the shared threat, uh, did, uh, did as they were told, as they were instructed. Um, to, to, I mean, if you look at the modeling, people assumed 50% compliance with, and we're getting 80, 85% compliance I and mean, this is quite extraordinary uh and you know this may now start to break down a bit because it's much more difficult now but when it happened it was quite impressive uh and a lot of mutual help and mutual support was was going off um so i you know i think that that's something that is is sort of in, you know, we, we, british exceptionalism always takes you back to 1940 um and uh, that's not particularly helpful, but I think that there was a sort of sense of all in it together that, that has been quite important. The final thing, though, is um, the renationalization of capabilities. Um, you know, the stories in, in the UK papers today, that one of the things, the lessons that certainly this government seems to have learned and being encouraged to learn is we want to be as independent of China as possible. Um, and uh, that in the pharmaceutical side as, uh, as well as other sides. And I, I don't think we're going to be the only country that comes to that conclusion. Um, so whether, and, and the economist we talked about before, talked about deglobalization and so on, I think there is going to be sort of repatriation probably the renational, uh, of key capabilities. It is going to be a short, whether we can afford it over the long term, and whether the old division of labor will come back is, is, uh, is another issue. But I think all of these things are important. And just as a final note, it's true, Francois, that uh, uh, I regret uh, the lack of foreign travel. At the moment, I'd quite like to get to the center of London. Uh, you know, um, uh, for someone of my, of my not so advanced years, but advanced enough, um, this is actually quite a quite a strange time um, because if there's one thing that we know about this pandemic, um, if you're over 70, it's not great news. Um, and the the other thing people are talking about a lot is the generational impact of this. Um, if you're under 40, you're you know it's not too bad. There's very few fatalities under 40. Uh, the, uh, after that, the older you get, the worse it looks. Um, and I think the, 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 the implications of that are going to take a while to sink in. At the moment, it leaves me rather stuck at home, though. But the opposite of that, of course, is that um, the economic consequences are uh, arguably reversed in terms of the generational impact, um, which is uh, uh, which is not good, I suppose. Uh, I, I was just wondering, Gigi, the, a couple of times it was mentioned, uh, I mean, I, and I, I, you weren't, you're not on this panel as an American, but uh, the um, surprising, I don't know if it was surprising, but the impressive level of com compliance 
with uh, you know, lockdown instructions that were not necessarily always that clear, but the fact is people took it seriously and have done it at great sacrifice. How does that look in the United States? Um, I mean, I think the, the polls, uh, even though there are some very vocal people um, who are, are flagrantly disregarding this, uh, most people are um, supportive of um, the, the public health measures that are taken. Um, I, think, I think unreasonable expectations were, were allowed to flourish about what this um, lockdown, you know, what, this, what this period of time will produce. I mean, we were saving our health system. Um, we were saving our hospitals from being overwhelmed. We were um, giving some more time for uh, doctors and you know to to get better at treating patients. And I think that those things both um, both occurred. But how we're going to go forward is is still is um, you know now that states are people are done with this. I mean, this is a, a pretty big social experiment. Um, that we're all living through in homeschooling and everything else and uh, online learning as uh, successful or unsuccessful as that is going to be. Um, but I, I think people are, are tired of it. And, um, and so what happens in the coming months is going to be, um, is, is going to be interesting to see. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of emphasis on putting, um, wearing masks to protect other people. And I think that works for some people but I think you're going to see more mask wearing when people start, when cases start getting closer and closer to home, when uh, people are more concerned about, you know, protecting themselves. And um, the, the, the guess is on when we're going to get a vaccine. I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I am very much encouraged by the progress that's been made and there are a lot of different shots on goal, but we still have many months to go for this crisis. And, um, and at the most optimistic, um, I wouldn't expect to see uh, maybe a vaccine, some vaccine candidates by the end of this year, but certainly not um, for a, a, the world is our customers for this vaccine when it comes out. So it's it's going to be um, some period of time before everybody gets a chance to have it. Okay, thank you. Um, we're almost out of time. I do want to. There, there was one question. Uh, so I have to apologize to everyone, including people I know and work with who I haven't been able to call on. But there was one question that I am going to take, uh, partly because it, it raises some issues that I was thinking about as I heard this discussion of China and other things, which was, it's from Paul Schulte. And he asks, how far will national governments be able to manage domestic criticisms of their handling of the pandemic without responding to or launching critical comparison of others? How serious and forgivable is denigratory, den, whatever the word is, information warfare reported from Russia and China over COVID about other, other national responses? More broadly, is, and this is the key question for me, is objective scientific investigation of COVID's origins, origins compatible with forward-looking global co cooperation over its mitigation? If not, what, which should take priority? So, you know, we have this war of words, which is spiraling into a very serious um, confrontation between the United States and China. And I'm not, now I'm speaking, but, um, you know, how do we manage this rivalry and this accountability at the same time as trying to deal as a global community with that which needs global solutions? Big question, out of time, who, want, who, who wants to take one minute? Yes, yes, Francois. Uh, uh, very quickly, uh, the American-Chinese polarization, the WC, did not begin with COVID. This was a, a tension you were going to, uh, which you already had, and which presumably uh, was going to get greater as China's superpower status uh, uh, was growing, and as American fear of déclassement was also growing. And indeed, and here is a paradox, uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, has a uh, has a non-systematic approach to China. There are days where he pays ample compliments to Xi Jinping. Actually, rather like some of the things that the authoritarian regime does, uh, and other days where he doesn't. Uh, 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 those who will eventually succeed him, 
whom that is and who that is, are presumably going to be much more systematic and structured in their approach to China uh, than this particular administration is in Washington. And COVID only reinforces, only reinforces that. And all of the things that we already had before are now just getting worse. The information warfare side, I, I, I see uh, how the, the wolf warriors at the uh, Chinese embassy in France are managing to destroy French-Chinese relations all on their own because it looks good for them back in Beijing. You know, this is a communist country anyway, uh, 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 with enormous domestic problems and with enormous domestic priorities. And the state of their international relations is not their primary uh, concern. And this also plays, unfortunately, into the hardening, uh, hardening of, uh, uh, of tensions. If I may, just the last, very last word, there are two words which I think people should keep in mind in thinking about the future here. In health, as in war, one must never confuse efficiency and effectiveness. What Laurie said about the pressure under which hospitals came in Britain to be more efficient, etc. It's true in all of our places. Uh, the pressure was to be economically efficient. But when you're economically efficient, when there is a really big problem, you cease to be effective. And one of the reasons why the Germans did so well is because they have a relatively inefficient uh, uh, hospital system with too many beds, too many respirators, if that's such a thing as possible, and they did extremely well. That is something which we have to take on board. That's where you get into the securite securitization uh, part of the debate. Thank you. Uh, Gigi, do you have any final, final comments or thoughts before we close? I do not. Thank you very much for having me on. Okay, well, thank you very much for a brilliant contribution. Laurie, last word, if you, if you want. No, I, th I, th I think we, we, uh, I, I agree with uh, Francois's last point. Uh, all I would say is if we, if we come back in a year's time, uh, uh, I suspect we, we will still have lots of uncertainties, but there'll be different ones to the ones we've got at the moment. We should do that. Uh oh, are you su suggesting that we see how how right we are? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, I think that I think the issues of the second wave, um, which are in all the models, um, and which there's a, a, a disposition to disbelieve at the moment, yeah. because it's too awful to think about, uh, it is a really big question, and. Um, and it's partly optimism, which Gigi to some extent has uh, um, whisked away about uh, about a quick vaccine. Partly hopes that the case fatality is not as bad, uh, or, the, or the infection is only a few super spread. I don't know. There's a lot. People are finding grounds for optimism because they don't really want to contemplate the fact that, uh, like the Spanish flu, it could come back in the winter with a vengeance. We don't know. Well, we don't know. Two years is pretty optimistic, actually, for a vaccine. Um, in 1918, it took them 15 years to figure out even what it was, and another uh, another 10 years on top of that to come up with a vaccine. So, in the time scale of things, I know it's not what we want, but it's way better than it could be. My grandfather was taken by the Spanish flu in in uh, 1918, and my parents were both in bed at the same time with the Asian flu of 1957. So I, I'm, um, I'm very anxious to see out this one. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. well, uh, yes, um, let, let, let's all um, uh, hope for all, all of us and <laughs> that that's the case. Um, I do want to, um, I do want to say two things in conclusion. We're, we're just five minutes over. Um, the first is that we've just touched the surface of, of what's discussed in all of these articles. So I strongly urge our listeners to get access to them. If they're not members or subscribers, um, you can go to the IISS website and um, purchase it through Amazon at a very reasonable, purchase this in individual issues by going to the survival page. Um, and secondly, again, my apologies to the to the multitudes that I wasn't able to call on or read their questions, but I 
we're very grateful for the, your, all of your participation. And again, very grateful to um, my three panelists and authors. And goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you.